Okay, so Seth, you are a guy who has a lot of projects on the go. You wear many hats. You've got your fingers in many pies. So rather than introducing you myself and risking messing it up, I might actually ask you to introduce yourself, if you could. Okay, well, I'm Seth Skorkowski. I'm a, I'm a novelist um, originally, and then I started a YouTube channel as a way to kind of help get my name out there as an author, and I made it about uh, role-playing games, and that ended up cresting past my popularity as an author. So now I have a YouTube channel under the highly imaginative name Seth Skorkowski, uh, where I do talk about role-playing games, uh, reviews of different systems or adventures or just how-tos or philosophies. Um, I am a member of the Modern Mythos podcast, which is about tabletop games, primarily Call of Cthulhu. I've written for a, a few RPG publishers. I've got uh, one Call of Cthulhu scenario in print. I've got a few more that are in different stages of development uh, with the publishers. I've written for Traveler, and I am currently uh, playtesting my scenario that I've written for Cult. So... I've got a couple little things that I've got. Just a couple? Yeah, wow. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Hello and welcome to RPG Quest, a podcast where we do not play Dungeons and Dragons, but we do play one-shots uh, of all kinds of weird and wonderful systems. My name is Chris, I am your host, and I will also be your keeper over the next few episodes as we play Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> but before we jump in and completely lose our minds to ancient beings from beyond space and time, we're going to take a, a little look at the system itself. So what is it? How does it run? Uh, what do you need to run it? And to help me do that is Seth Skorkowski. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm I'm great. How are you doing? I'm awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, Seth, I have to say, as far as your YouTube channel and your YouTube videos go, they are particularly fantastic, I think. Like the ones on Call of Cthulhu in particular have been very helpful. I do send them to all my players ahead of running my Call of Cthulhu games. I think I would I, I would go out on a limb and say, you know, if if anyone is looking to to look into how the system works in a bit more granular detail. I would say that they're probably the best videos out there on how to do that. Oh, thank you. But yeah, so Call of Cthulhu is what we're going to focus on today. So Seth, I wanted to to ask if you were to say, give me your 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 best elevator pitch. Why should someone check out Call of Cthulhu? Okay. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, Call of Cthulhu is a skill based tabletop game that is focused on investigative horror. So it's a very story-based game that uh, really encourages and really allows for a lot of role play through story. Yeah. And, um, you know, as the name would suggest, Call of Cthulhu, it's based off the works of H.P. Lovecraft, who I think if you're, even if you're not familiar with his work specifically, everyone is definitely familiar with the, the themes and the tropes of his work because the influence is just so massively felt through cinema, TV, gaming, and not just in the horror genre as well. Um, how would you describe, like when we call something Lovecraftian, what, what makes something Lovecraftian, do you think? Uh, well, a lot of people will always say something like tentacles, but <laughs> um, for, for me, what makes something Lovecraftian is uh, a lot of stuff had to do with the the unknowable or the concept of cosmic horror, which was uh, basically that humanity is is actually pretty insignificant um in in the in the grand scheme and the the creatures that are in call of cthulhu are uh, kind of beyond space and time or from distant worlds and humanity is nothing that they even think about uh versus 
we are the, the the kind of the stars or sitters of the universe. We're really just what happened to be infesting this planet at the moment. Um, and that is kind of the, the center of their horror is it's not monsters that are out to get us. They are monsters that are doing their own thing and will probably crush us and not even notice we were there. And I think perhaps what makes it like, yeah, particularly scary um, and what makes them particularly great monsters is that you can never really know their true motivations or why they're doing what they're doing. They're beyond sort of comprehension in that regard. Yeah. And th the other thing is they're not based off of uh, folklore. You know, when we we, do, we play D&D, &D, we're, we're usually playing off stuff that's got a lot of, you know, uh, Greek mythology, a lot of European folklore with different creatures, a lot of, you know, a lot of very popular fantastical things going back to you know, just ancient times, you know, and, and Arthurian legend and Brothers Grimm and all of these are kind of folded in to kind of classic fantasy gaming. Call of Cthulhu, what made the Lovecraft universe also so weird is it wasn't based off of any of that stuff. You know, it was uh, giant blob creatures that would make eyes and mouths spontaneously as they chased you. And, you know, <laughs> you know weird, weird, um, you know, uh, flies that were made out of fungus and that would steal your brain and put it in a jar and talk to you through a radio transceiver. That was so sh shockingly different than a big hairy beast man and a dragon and you know, all the, all the other stuff that was popping up in the weird tales to stories at the times. Yeah. It's extremely creepy. And I think he himself, uh, Lovecraft himself, has sort of become folklore with these idea of the deep ones, right? Like, cause I'm sure everyone's played Dungeons and Dragons. I think the idea of things like the, um, Aboleths and the, the, the old ones and stuff, they, they seem to be very inspired by Lovecraft. Oh, definitely. Uh, things like the, the mind flayers. Yeah. Uh, very, very popular D and D monster look very Cthulhu based. And, uh, you know, and Gygax wrote about that. His his stuff, uh, that he, but he was basing the idea on had a lot of do with the old pulps and the old sword and sorcery stuff. But um, you know, at that point, uh, Tolkien had become massively popular, and they kind of leaned into the the Tolkien aspect because that's what he was was, was you know wasn't the style at the time, but. Lovecraft or Gygax, when you look into a lot of stuff that he was using to base D and D on, was more you know, Lovecraft or Robert E. Howard uh, or Fritz Leiber, and not as much Tolkien as as people would have thought. It was certainly there, but one of the more minor influences in the in the grand scheme of you know D and D influences. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, so the presence of the the Cthulhu mythos, these these ancient beings that transcend space and time is 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 basically the the big theme of call of cthulhu and of lovecraft's works i think one of the the other tropes the or a few of the other tropes that his works and therefore the game kind of explore as well are things like uh ancient tribes and lost civilizations you've got cursed items and, and evil books and that kind of that kind of thing does that come into play a lot in the games in in the games that they do come up quite a bit um, because you will find uh, remnants of the the serpent people uh, who who lived on Earth long ago and now live below the surface or you know, the the mountains of madness were uh, deep beneath the glaciers in Antarctica is this city of the aliens that created life on Earth and uh, various things like that. So, uh, Lovecraft stories, uh, Call of Cthulhu is usually based in the 1920s. That's the most popular setting. Um, the, the setting can actually be, you know, I think there's Roman, there's dark ages, there's wild west, uh, mm. gaslight, you know, there's, there's a lot of different time periods, but that was kind of the most kind of classic. And a lot of modern ones as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, but one of the things which you have to remember is Lovecraft based all the stories in the 1920s and 30s, because that's when he was alive and writing. Um, so they were very, at the time, cutting edge modern. And he would talk about a lot of the newest technology at the time, because with, uh, with fantasy, fantasy is a long ago time, you know, some nebulous faraway land that is vaguely medievalish. Uh, Lovecraft wrote about 
today, right now, this is what's going on. There's, you know, there's a, a city of these underwater creatures and the newest submarine fired torpedoes at their city and it did nothing. Uh, you know, so he would pull in, you know, the, the, the most modern technology at the time, mm. uh, which is one of the things with horror is when you've got the modern day, you know, horror stories where it's not the fantasy land a long way away. It's down the street right now. That's where this is. This this is that's where the horror is happening. Yeah, I think some of his work can even be considered, you know, quite quite sci-fi as well. Oh yeah, you know, looking into like what if this technology existed and that kind of thing. And yeah, I think that's great like, because yeah, the the main setting is 1920s because that's like you said the era and time that he was writing. But the, yeah, the game is so much more broad than that. Like you like you were saying, cowboys, modern adventures, sci-fi adventures, all that kind of stuff. I mean, what what sort of scope have, of adventures have you run in terms of time and theme? Um, most of what we've done is 1920s and 30s. Uh, it's been the primary setting. Uh, we've done some modern day. I'm, I'm looking at actually uh, running a little bit of modern day, uh, kind of in the short future. We're going to take a, a slight veer into playtesting and screwing around with Blade Runner, and then we're going to do a modern day Cthulhu game. Oh, cool. Um I'm looking forward to the seventh edition Call of Cthulhu by Gaslight. I've been waiting for that for years. Uh, they keep promising me it's just around the corner. I think they're just messing with me. So I really want to do that 1890s uh, London Jack the Ripper and all that uh, setting, which yeah. they've done in previous editions. But since they keep promising there's the, the newest one coming, it's like, well, I want to wait for the newest one. I don't want to. I don't want to be wrapping up my gaslight campaign right when they release the new gaslight. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> and yeah, you know, for very little one shots, I've done. I've done western, and uh, we've done sixties and seventies. Oh, cool. There's a uh, there's a couple. Um, uh, Alex Gillette, uh, probably horribly mispronouncing his last name, has done several 1970s Call of Cthulhu adventures, kind of his, uh, his Grindhouse series, which those are just delightful. Uh, yes. Yeah, very 1970s B-movie. Oh, they're wonderful. I don't know if it was the same author. I'll have to look into it. But I, I did run a Grindhouse-style game, um, which was set in the 80s in a goth club. And it was like an all-out vampire slasher. So it was, you know, very, very dusk till dawn inspired. Oh my god! Yeah, a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, Ooh, you know. What was that one called? I, it, it was just called Grindhouse, um, and there were two adventures in it. And this one was called mm. uh, the Court of the Crimson King, which was the name of the the goth club. So a bunch of you know youths, punks, whatnot, all all spend a night in a in a goth club looking for their missing friend, and then get locked in as the uh, you know the music turns up, the smoke machines turn on, and uh, then the vampires start picking everyone off. They've got to try and survive. As a as a, as a person who used to frequent a lot of goth clubs, and with several of my players, we used to frequent a lot of goth and industrial clubs. This I've written this title down. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend it. It was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, a few of them made it, managed to make it out alive, uh, which is great. Um, I think another big Lovecraftian trope, or maybe this is just a trope that's present in the Call of Cthulhu games. Um, this is something that I've come across a lot when running scenarios and campaigns, and it, it's it's that there there's always a character who, by all means, is either exceptional, maybe they're a genius, a scholar, or someone who's quite capable, who all of a sudden loses their mind and begins acting strange. And it's always later to be revealed to be the influence or the effects of some kind of old one, some kind of elder being. It can be the hook into the story or it can you know, be a, a revelation that comes later. But I think that that's something that appears very often, which is a, which is a great trope. Oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the, the NPC that has learned too much. Um, no, that's a very popular trope. I don't, some of it, I think, came from Lovecraft. I think it's been more of just something that's in the game. And it's also just a very big storytelling thing. Like, uh, oh God, forgive me for bringing this movie up, but the Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, uh, John Hurt played that character who was the, <laughs> the, the doctor who had looked too deep into cosmic things and lost his mind. Um, sort of hook. So that's it's a pretty big storytelling thing. Which, oh man, why'd I have to bring up that Indiana Jones movie? It's 
I feel dirty. Uh, I I don't <laughs> think it's it's as, it's as bad. It gets a bad rap. I quite enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, you've got to be forgiving about these kind of things. I thought it was fun. <sighs> I don't really remember much of what happens. I remember I saw it at the movies and was like, oh, that was that was all right. Yeah, it was, it was an Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, yeah, speaking of movies, um, you know, are there, I mean, there've been lots of adaptations of Lovecraft's works. There's, I think there's, there's also things that are, that have been very influenced by Lovecraft. Like even things like, um, True Detective kind of delves into the, the Cthulhu mythos a bit. Do you have a, a you know, a favorite kind of Lovecraft adaptation movie or show or anything like that? Um, well, there's a few, uh, the, the one that isn't Lovecraft directly uh, is uh, The Thing, John Carpenter's version of The Thing. Mm. We're going to draw a little bit of everybody's blood. We're going to find out who's The Thing. Uh, Carpenter is a a very confessed Lovecraft fan, um, and you could tell that with... um, uh, in the Mouth of Madness, which he also did, which is very, yes. very Lovecraft uh, inspired. But uh, John Carpenter's The Thing is a very big one. Direct Lovecraft based movies, and they are kind of all over the spectrum as far as quality. Uh, there is Dagon, which um, is going to turn into this modern day story in Spain. Ah, uh, yeah. That's based um, on... Which is based off the uh, the Shadow over Innsmouth. Yeah. And From Beyond uh, are probably two of the better ones. Uh, From Beyond is kind of funny in the sense that the the short story that it's based on is is covered it pretty much in its entirety in the movie before the opening credits. Okay. <laughs> like... It, the, the first five minutes of the movie, we cover the entire Lovecraft story. And then there's the rest of the movie. Um, but that's where a scientist creates some sort of uh, machine that allows him to basically see the creatures that are living in a dimension j- just parallel to ourselves. Wow. And you know, the things that come through. Yeah, wow. I haven't seen that one. I'll have to check it out. It's delightful. No, <laughs> oh, it sounds great. One that I watched recently, which, um, you know, is, uh, I'll confess, a lot more uh, goofy, although still pretty grisly, is um, uh, Reanimator. Oh. Which I, I thought was <laughs> very fun. No, uh, Reanimator is, uh, that's another one where the, the the story itself actually isn't that good. Uh, Lovecraft wrote those as a serial uh, where you're like, you know, like, you know, tune in next week for, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the Herbert West Reanimator. And uh, Lovecraft didn't even really kind of know where he was going with it. Is is kind of just a paycheck sort of thing. The the movie, hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, is, is better. Um, you know, there there are several deviations, but the the film is actually uh, much more enjoyable, I believe, than the uh, the original story. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Gruber, Doctor Gruber, we can't stand. Grover! Ah! 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 Of course he's dead. The dosage was too large. Well, yeah, so there's a wide scale of scope and settings and styles that you can use Call of Cthulhu for. But as you were saying, like at its heart, it's a game of horror and a game of investigation. I would probably break down and you can, I will see if you agree with me here. I would probably break down Call of Cthulhu adventures into maybe three distinct styles. Like one is the, the investigation game. And this is, would be where your players are very proactive investigators trying to get to the bottom of something. They may be occult investigators. They may not. They may they may be private detectives or um, police agents or something like that. The second one would be your players are normal people who stumble upon something weird, you know, possibly world ending, and kind of have to figure out what to do about it, if anything. Uh, and the third would be just your straight up survival horror, like your monster movie, like like The Thing or you know, Alien or Deep Rising. Like something is coming to kill you and you better figure out what to do about it quick. Do you think that's that's probably fair? Uh, 
Yeah. Um, and and because also the big thing with the uh, kind of your second and third is they're normal people. Uh, one of the things with, with Call of Cthulhu that I, I really do enjoy is you're, you're, you're making a normal character. He's a cab driver. He's an accountant. Hmm. Uh, you know, they, they might be a police officer or detective or soldier, but yeah, just as often, you know, they're, they're a, a professor of, of something or, or just some humdrum average Joe who ends up in this fantastic situation where they're, uh, they inherited something and it's uh, from, from a distant uncle and there's a secret or they end up in that survival horror situation. And, you know, now they're in, uh, some remote town in the middle of nowhere, some, some mining thing and things, something horrible is coming out of the mine. Uh, so those are definitely mm. uh, some of the other big themes. And then you have kind of the first one where it's like you might be paranormal investigators. Like this might be your jam and this is what we do. Um, and those are the, – the, the game is certainly accommodating for that. But it's really designed um, to be kind of first and foremost be you are an average person who has now ended up in a completely uh, – bonkers situation that you are probably not prepared for yeah i definitely prefer uh that style i think there's something to be said about yeah being an ordinary person who begins to you know just uncover strange and horrific things and kind of have their layers of reality slowly peeled away yeah, and you know, to, to reveal the horrors underneath but yeah then there's also the aspect if you are doing the investigative thing you can do the x-files sort of deal where you know, you, you, you work for, you know, the, some sort of police or, or government unit to investigate, you know, these weird things that, that have absolutely stumped other investigators. Yeah. You know, you're the, you're the, you're the people that handle the, the supernatural or alien stories. And, you know, that's also just a fantastic way to keep your characters always having an adventure as they get into assignment. Um, or you're just part of that detective agency that, that looks into the, the cases no one else will do. And, you know, every week you have somebody come up and tell you about that box they inherited from their uncle. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways. It's not just one thing. You know, it's kind of like D and D. There are so many ways you can play the game, but a lot of people just kind of classically think it's like, well, you got your, your cleric, your fighter, your thief, and you go into dungeons. Like, yeah, that's certainly a way. But there's a lot more. And and Call of Cthulhu has that really wide diversity. And you could do so many different types of stories with it. But kind of the key themes, though, is you've got the horror and uh, investigation, meaning you're, you're discovering something or there's a mystery to solve. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the the system a little bit. We won't go into too much detail. But in a, in a nutshell, Call of Cthulhu is a D100 system, meaning... You've got your, your a bunch of characteristics, which would probably be pretty familiar, like strength, uh, intelligence, education, and then you've got all your skills, which might be brawl or, or library use or drive. You roll your, your D100 and then you try and get underneath it. It's simple. And what I really like about it is that it's very um, self-explanatory. Like you don't need to be reading through the book and thinking, oh, what, you know, what feat should I take? What racial ability or spell do I like best and learning different terminology. It's, you know, it's very straightforward. If you want a character who's good at driving, you put points into drive auto. And I think that makes the game uh, very approachable. Oh yeah. I, when it comes to games that I can take a complete uh, noob who, I mean, who might not even be familiar with, with, with playing tabletop games. Uh, I can get them playing in a couple minutes uh, just because you know, all the skills are right there. Uh, you know, whether it's your, your, your drive auto or your ability to, to charm or, you know, whatever. And they all start with a value. Um, so some of the times, like some games, it'll start like at zero. Like, well, if you don't have it, you can't try it. Like drive, everyone has a 20% and drive everyone. Mm. But when you make your character, you can choose to improve that even more. And there's also pretty much no math in the game. When you write down your your skill level, you also note down what its half value is and what its one fifth value is, and those are your success ranks. So if um, if you've got a twenty, you'd also have like a, a ten and a, a four, 
been right next to it. So if you roll your percentage dice and you get, you know, any of those values or less, it means different levels of success. So there's not really like, well, you've got a minus five on this. It's like, give me a hard success. That means that 50% or give me mm. an extreme success. That means you have to get that one fifth value. Or if you're uh, in an opposed task, like an opposed strength check, you both roll and it's not just success, but also who gets the better level of success. So you know, if, we, if we both succeeded, but you got a hard success, meaning under 50% and I get regular, you beat me. Yeah. Uh, so all of that's built in. There's no calculation needed. It's all just written right there. And other bonuses could be done through just bonus or penalty die where you roll an additional um, D10s die and take the lowest if it's a bonus or the highest if it's a penalty. And so it's very quick and very intuitive. And there's not sitting there things like, well, I got a plus 15 for this, but I got a minus five for this. There's none of that. Yeah. And I think another thing that I think is pretty neat about uh, the D100 system is um, even if you're not used to RPGs, you can understand how good an investigator is at a skill just, just by eyeballing the rating. Like if someone's got a 70 in something, well, they have a 70% chance of succeeding. So I think that's that's great as well. No, you can you can visualize what your chance of success is, which is is a lot harder if you're doing something where you've got a uh, stat plus skill plus a die roll, and then we have to hit an arbitrary number. Mm. Uh, or if we have to do a multiple dice rolls, like we roll 2d6, and we're trying to do it on a 1 to, or a 2 to 12 scale, it's very hard for people to visualize the the percent chances of success there yeah because it's it's not a straight number uh, and um, with the percentage based system where it's like you have a seventy percent chance of success well that's pretty simple for all of us to to visualize that I've got a pretty good chance of doing this or you've got a ten percent chance so, oh okay maybe I shouldn't try that there's there's only a ten percent chance so yeah yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> But sometimes it's worth it's worth uh, giving it a shot because you never know. Oh yeah, now so, sometimes you you end up in the situation like, well, I gotta try it. But <laughs> y- you also understand the risk, and it brings that tension with it. Mm. I've only got a ten percent chance of uh, of doing it, and that's when everybody kind of holds their breath and watches that die at the table as they're like, let's see, if, let's see if they do it. Yeah, and with with the skills themselves, um, I think some of them are geared towards that 1920s style um like you were saying someone brings you a weird box like you've got skills like um archaeology or appraise or something like that but what i like about it is there's there's room to create modern skills as well like you can have computers you can add like science specializations like nuclear physics or something if you wanted to stuff like that so you can create a pretty comprehensive character that kind of fits any setting really yeah and it's like with the with like modern day Setting Call of Cthulhu, it has things like um, uh, computer use, mm. which I, th- I think a lot of people mistake computer use, and they think that means like I'm going to Google something. Well, it's, it's library search. It's just the modern version of a, a library search role. Uh, but computer use would be I'm going to hack my way into the database, or I'm going to uh, restore this damaged hard drive to see if I can find any information that was on it or, or you know, the actual technical uh, sides of computer use. And that's just a skill like any other. It's just you don't have it in the 1920s because, well, you know, computer technology really wasn't a thing at the time. Uh, but in, in modern games, we will have more modern skills. And on the modern character sheets, I think – like anthropology, I think, kind of pe- fell off of that one. It's still in the game, but it's like it's so rare mm. that you have to like write that one in. Um, and because there are it, it, the character sheets, always do write out the skills, except for some that are just so rare that you have to just kind of fill it in one of the blank spots. Because like we're not going to fill every character sheet up with reading lips. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, it, it's a thing you could, if you want it, you can get it and just, just write it down. We didn't, we didn't pre-fill that one in because it's so rare and there's the character sheets are only so big. Yeah. But I do like that, that there is room to, to, to squeeze in your own specializations or your own skills as well. And, um, yeah, there are no classes obviously, but you, you do also pick a career. Um, and again, like some of them are very flavored, 
uh, very 1920s flavored, like Delatante or uh, Alienist, I think stuff like that. But then, yeah, there's there's modern ones in the book too. So I think that's great. You can be a computer engineer or a forensic surgeon, or you know, you could just be a, a bartender or someone normal, like you were saying. So I think whatever's going to fit your game best, there's there's something there's something there for it. So that there's a lot to be said about that as well. Well, but yeah, you know, though I think I think a modern day Delatante game you know, or debutante game, I guess, would be wonderful. I mean, think about it. You're it's like keeping up with the Kardashians. Meets the thing. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is there is a scenario that's kind of like that that I came across. I think it's in Peterson's Abominations, and it's called the Derelict. And it's very good. You're a bunch of. Uh, it's a modern scenario. You're a bunch of friends on a yacht, sailing the yacht across the ocean, like one last sort of hurrah before your friend sells the yacht. Oh yeah, you're all drinking champagne. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the characters is uh, it comes with some pre-made ones, and one of them is is exactly that. They're like you know a social media star and heiress. Uh, you know, it's great. Yeah, and so it's like yeah, I mean, you can still do it. It's just I, I guess a lot of people don't imagine like. Yeah, they're going to be like uh, some some social media influencer, um, but at the same time, there's also a ton of modern day games where it's like uh, ghost hunters. Mm. Uh, one of the another modern day one is called Viral, where it's a group of people who are live streaming a ghost hunt on in an Italian um, abandoned Italian insane asylum. Oh wow! And the audience of this live stream is interacting with them. And because they're trying to get like their million subscriber mark. And as this weird stuff starts happening, they're doing all these stunts because people on the, the YouTube or Twitch audience are, are doing the, the thing where you pay money mm. to basically dare them to, you know, uh, crawl inside the, the, you know, the mortuary thing. I mean, it's, oh it's goodness. a delightful <laughs> adventure and it's just a completely modern day. Uh, yeah. What's it called? I'll have to check that one out. It's called Viral. Viral. Oh, wow, that's definitely going on the list. That sounds incredible. Um, as far as uh, skills and characteristics go, though, there are a few that are distinct to Call of Cthulhu, and this is where the game differs from others. Um, and these are the three characteristics, are sanity, power, and luck. Let's talk about sanity as a skill and, and how sanity loss works, because I think this is the biggest part of what makes Call of Cthulhu Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu was the, the first game that ever introduced a, basically a version of mental hit points. Mm. And you know, other games have since kind of put their own spin on it. But I think since Call of Cthulhu was the first, it became one of the things that's just it's still known for 40 years later. Uh, so you have a, a sanity score and it is anywhere from zero to 99 and uh whenever your character encounters the stranger a natural sort of thing uh you roll that just like a skill and if you roll under it you are probably not always fine but if you roll over it um you will you will lose or have a potential to lose sanity it's kind of it, it sinks in what you're looking at and it will go down and if it goes down too fast or if there's a big a lot of it at once you might suffer a bout of madness which is you panic mm. and your character might you know uh they might throw the flashlight that they're holding at the bad guy and then go running off into the darkness uh or they might faint or just start just start kind of babbling or you know different things and yeah there's a great table in the book on their with all the different oh uh, they're fun the, the bout of madness things and yeah they're yeah, <laughs> uh, there is there is one series called Blood Brothers where it's based off of basically schlocky horror movies, and it has its own sanity tales like your hair turns white and um, <laughs> <laughs> stuff off of, like just stuff of bad bad like horror movies. And uh, then if you lose a, a, a large amount of sanity in, in a short amount of time, you can develop longer term effects such as you know. Um, you might have a, a fear of insects or a fear of flowers or different types of manias. Um, yeah. Some of them are a bit silly as well. I had one where a character rolled uh, a phobia of women, which is a bit odd. <laughs> I always recommend. So I, so, so the GM trick with this is there, there's two approaches. If, if you're in your game and you roll, let's say a fear of women and you're like, 
what what does that have to do with the slime monster that came out of the water? Like, why would I randomly have a fear of women? The GM can also ask, why do you? And you can come up with how that weird mental connection worked of, well, it linked this way. And if you can't, since you roll the, the, the uh, type of madness or insanity off of a percentile chart as well, I just invert the numbers to see if that one's better. Like, well, 75 sucked. Let's see what 57 did. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll go with, we'll go with the, the more, the one we can make more logical. So those are my two tricks whenever we do get mm. a, a, a phobia or a mania that is just completely bonkers compared to whatever the situation is. Um, or I might just assign it. Or you can just pick one as well. Yeah. 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 I, I did that in my um, game for the, for the actual play because the investigator had a very hectic dream kind of witnessing the the coming of these old ones and saw his ex-wife in, in the dream. And so I, I gave him the phobia of dreams, which meant for the next uh, leg of the, the scenario, he just didn't want to sleep. So he was up all night, not sleeping, going crazy, obsessing over this investigation. So that played into it really well. Oh, yeah. And you can, you can be like, um, yeah, they develop like a, an, an addiction to like amphetamines or something to stay awake, or mm. they drink themselves so badly that they have dreamless sleep and and now you have a character who is who's actually going through alcoholism because they're trying to achieve that level where when i fall asleep i don't even dream uh and it, it kind of adds those those aspects to yeah the character and as you were saying um the it whittles down as you lose points making it harder and harder to succeed on roles as time goes on so that represents the the growing loss of sanity but what about um oh recovering sanity there are ways to recover sanity loss right well, the easiest way is you know, providing it doesn't hit zero because the final stage is if your sanity ever hit zero you're done your character is, is just permanently broken but recovering can be done a few ways uh, the first uh, and the most common is when you complete a, an adventure you can get sanity rewards like i saved you know the child and i defeated the cult or i killed the monster or whatnot those have their own values you know so you're you roll a d8 because you you stopped the cult and you can add that to your sanity score so there is at that phase at the end where everybody's sanity does get a little better mm. hopefully if they did good enough um or they can seek uh their therapy and there's a lot of different ways they can do it they can do like self-help they can lock they can basically have themselves committed for a bit they can get themselves on, you know, a, a, a regular shrink that they start seeing, which can be fun because that's now this NPC mm. and they might have a panic attack and might have to call their shrink, you know, in the middle of the adventure. Um, and so they, they can act, they can do therapy and uh, different sorts of things. They can do a sabbatical if they have in their character backstory that. Uh, they have a special place, the the farm where they grew up with mom and dad. They can have in that time between adventures, I'm going to visit the family farm because that's the most special place on earth for me and recover their sanity by connecting yeah. with those aspects of their, themselves. And once again, that really does enhance the role play aspect because it's not just a, uh, the, the cleric or healer snaps their fingers and they're better. You'll have after an adventure, the group might split up. And, you know, so-and-so goes off to the asylum, you know, so-and-so goes off to visit the the, fa the family farm and uh, another person goes and, you know, uh, sails across the Atlantic Ocean. And then two months later, we all get together. And then the other person, they just went to night school during that time. So we all get back together after it's over and a few of us have gotten mentally healed. And meanwhile, Ricky has, you know, gotten us some points in archaeology and now we have the next adventure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. I think it's worth mentioning as well that obviously sanity as it's portrayed in Call of Cthulhu isn't, isn't meant to uh, simulate real world psychological trauma. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's an approximation of how HP Lovecraft's protagonists, you know, react in the face of horrifying sights and terrible creatures and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, um, it, 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 it no, no game has ever been able to pull off any actual realistic depiction of, of that. Uh, I next wanted to talk about luck because that's another thing that I don't know if it's completely unique to Call of Cthulhu, but it definitely makes the system um, what it is. So let's talk about luck as a skill and how luck 
works. Okay. Um, there's there's two main ways that luck works. It is a uh, first. It like sanity is on a scale of zero to ninety nine. So you can have a luck anywhere in that that range. Uh, the first way it can be used is if you fail a skill roll. So if you want to drive car, you have a fifty percent chance, and you roll a fifty five. You can say, "I would like to burn five points of luck," and you you burn five points of luck. Your fifty is now fifty five. Your you know, your fifty five is now fifty, and you succeed. And we continue on with the game, but your luck has been lowered by that many points. Um, so it is a buffer where you can kind of pull success from the jaws of failure. Uh, but the other way that it's used is when there are cases where the GM needs to determine basically luck, those things that you can't really, there's not really a skill for. Uh, one of the examples they have is finding a taxi cab at two in the morning in the rain. That's not a skill. I mean, that's just blind luck or, you know, the monster is going to attack one of the five people. You know, who's it going to attack? Uh, that's, that's luck. So you would then roll that like a skill check. So of course you would like to succeed because you, you would like to either find the taxi cab or not get eaten by the monster. So the person who has the lowest luck is most likely going to be failing that one. And that is, that's kind of the, the long cost that you could yeah. have is, do I want to succeed the skill check now? Or I don't want to lower my luck too much on the overall because, you know, some of it's, when the bomb goes off, it might be a luck roll to see who gets hit by the pieces of debris. Yeah. And the person who spent all their luck points, they keep getting hit by the pieces of debris or getting attacked by the monster or those, those other cases where a luck roll was used. Mm. I had a, a, a moment like that in actually in the, the vampire slasher game as they managed to, to escape from this basement club and climb out the window. Two of them got on... Uh, on the motorcycle, I had him roll luck to see if uh, the motorcycle was was uh, close by. Succeeded. He and his uh, the player who was his girlfriend got on the motorcycle and drove off. The other player ran out onto the street to try and get a cab. Had them roll luck. They failed. And then, of course, the final scene was just one of the vampires tackling him down to the ground out of nowhere. They followed them out of the club. No, and that's 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 that a perfect a example of you know is your is your motorcycle nearby? Like I don't know. So you're kind of handing that to luck. You know, it's like, well, let's see if it is. And th that is also kind of the deterrent to keep people from overspending on luck. Um, a lot of times when we do have a new player, the idea of failing a skill roll is so distasteful that they will burn through all their luck very quickly. So that way they never fail anything. And then the second half of the game, usually when the stakes have, have risen, they suddenly really regret the fact that they mm. re re just refused to fail a skill roll and they spent all their luck on usually very simple things that in the grand scheme didn't really matter. Yeah. I think it's worth Where, saying that, yeah, you're going to fail a lot in this game. You know, so keep that in mind. And one of the, th the, the, the philosophies by Call of Cthulhu that actually really did change my approach to tabletop games in general is it's very open with the idea of, Players roll all their own skill rolls. Players know if they fail because it gives them the option to, to either push the roll or use luck. So they need to know if they failed, if they want to modify it. But it also does add that bit of tension of you walk into the room and the game master is like, hey, uh, roll a spot. You know, roll, roll your perception. And they roll. It's like, and everyone failed. Everyone at that table knows they just failed to notice something. Mm. And that's when... Everyone at the table is kind of looking around and going, uh-oh, what, what is it we're missing? They know they're missing something. And and that's also where the temptation of pushing the roll or using luck or, well, maybe we'll find out later. Um, because I used to always be the type of GM that would roll those in secret. That way the players wouldn't know and it wouldn't influence. Um, because, you know, the characters don't know that they failed something. They didn't. They, but mm. in this in this game, you want them to know. Because it's it, it increases the tension for them, and that's part of the what makes a horror game horror is that mood and that tension. Definitely, they know they failed. Well, let's um, move on to combat now very quickly. Um, how do you find the combat system in Call of Cthulhu personally? Okay, well, I'm I'm controversial here. A lot of people say that Call of Cthulhu is not a game 
uh, for combat where if the, if the, you know, if the guns come out, you've already lost sort of thing. Uh, I've played a lot of tabletop role-playing games, especially modern day ones with firearms. Uh, Call of Cthulhu is the best at them. What? And by that, it's also horrifically deadly. Uh, getting shot will ruin your day. Um, <laughs> So it, it it has that sense of realism. You're not going to be able to take seven sword swipes and you know, and and laugh it off. Uh, but at the same time, we have a ton of options and, and dynamics that we can have where um, you know you're, you're running and moving and diving for cover because it makes you harder to hit, and uh, you you're out of ammunition in your revolver, but you can like get one bullet in there and, and slam it you know, slam the cylinder shut and get one shot. And it's really difficult at this point, but you know, all, all of those little desperate things that make cinematic fighting possible. And it's all done through just bonus and penalty dice. Mm. And because I've, I, I used to come from cyberpunk 2020 that, that could do that, but there was so much math involved. Like, okay, you get a plus four for this, but a minus five for that. And now we have to hit this particular target number. And yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of numbers getting thrown around. Call of Cthulhu, it's like, okay, roll your two hit. You have to make a hard success. You have one penalty die. And they just roll the die. Yeah. Uh, so there is a lot of cinematicness to it. But it is extremely deadly. And it your hit points never go up. So you might your character might have 10 hit points. Well, uh, uh, a 45 pistol does a D10 plus two. Well, it doesn't take much math to figure out a bullet will probably kill your character and there's no magic healing. So it could take days, weeks to recover from, you know, getting stabbed like real life. Yeah. <laughs> so it does. I find it makes players. Um, well, there's, there's the two stages. They, they came from heroic fantasy games. They get in their first combat and they get their butts handed to them because they're used to heroic fantasy combats. But once they learn that this is, you play this like you would really would, you know, would you really charge while six people are shooting at you? Um, it makes them play very smart and very creatively because they they start thinking very tactically as far as I am going to move here because there's cover. I am going to do this to keep myself safe. I will uh, squeeze off a few shots as I am running between these points. I know it gives me a bunch of minuses, but it makes me harder to hit and I have cover at the end, which and those are all the decisions you would have to make in a real situation. Yeah, I, It's not standing perfectly still and taking an aimed shot because someone's going to shoot you before that's done. So yeah. <laughs> it, it does create a very, a lot of movement to the game and a lot of thought beyond uh, I rolled a hit, I hit in, you know, next, next player. So I love it. Yeah. I always say I am in a minority <laughs> on that philosophy. <laughs> no, no. I think that's, that's fair to say. I, I've played, uh, GURPS recently because that's meant to simulate, you know, be very realistic. And the amount of maths in figuring it out where you're like, okay, so, you know, the the, the guy is running, he's moving uh, with full speed. So that's going to be a minus five. Your aim, you've spent a round aiming. So that's going to be a plus two, but he's about to die behind. There's there's so much maths. Whereas this is, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's struck a good balance between uh, the realism and having a nice sort of cinematic flow to it, which I think is is great. And I do always say that, yeah, if you wouldn't do it in real life, you shouldn't do it in Call of Cthulhu. No, no. And, you know, yeah, it is fun to have your, your uber hero that's got 200 hit points go wading into to combat and, and just, you know, that's, that's, that's fun. But I love the kind of the, the gritty realism of this where, uh, if a, a street kid might come out with a switchblade and ask for your money, that switchblade poses a very real threat to your life, no matter how experienced your character is. Um, there's no, I've got, the, you, know, mm. you can stab me 80 times. My hit points are so high. It's always like, uh oh, that could ruin my day. Yeah. <laughs> As you were saying, the a typical investiga investigator has like somewhere between 10 and maybe 14 hit points. And it's pretty straightforward as you take damage, your hit points go down. But um, another thing where things get different, which is good, is is with um, major wounds and how wounds work. It's like over... I think it's if you take more than half 
uh, an investigator's HP in in one attack, yeah, you you fall prone and you might pass out. Yeah, and it's it, it's it's wonderful if you're uh, if you're wanting to uh, it, it capacitate your characters and um, you know then they wake up in a you know in a mad scientist laboratory somewhere. But and if you've got between you know ten and fourteen hit points, that means between five and seven. And yeah, that's kind of hard to do if you're doing it with a with a fist. But it, once you start pulling in weapons like crowbars and swords, that's that's really really attainable in in one hit. So it, it's a game where you do not want to get hit at all. And you, I always always tell my players for our longer games, um, dodge should never be forgotten as when they're choosing where to put their skill points. Like dodge is probably the most valuable skill in this game because it keeps you from getting hit and you can usually stick around long enough to do something to stop something from trying to hurt you if you can keep it from hitting you. Mm. And it's probably also a good idea to have a few backup characters ready. Oh yeah. And well, depending on the campaign, you can actually often work your backup characters in. Um, one of my, my favorite methods that I've uh, heard of is in the campaign horror on the Orient express where you're on the Orient express train is your backup characters are kind of in your private party. So it'd be like, well, I am the debutante and I have my, my Butler and you know, my best friend with me and we have passengers on the train and then the debutante gets killed or goes insane. Well, all of a sudden the best friend gets involved in the investigation because that was a backup character. Mm. And then the butler wants to find out what happened to the, the, his employer. So it, it's with that one, you literally walk in as these little packs of characters. <laughs> yeah, that's great. As, <laughs> as things happen, you're like, well, he was there the whole time, so we don't have to catch him up. And um, Or if they're part of an investigation, like I was mentioning at the X-Files, like you're part of a uh, you know, special FBI or police unit. Well, you're now just the next person assigned to the case that also includes figure out what happened to the last agent we sent in. Um, those I find really useful versus in one shots. I like the idea of you are a, a random bank teller that has ended up in this situation with, with the monster, but on longer campaigns, I like to have some way built in, to where we can quickly get a backup character activated and into the game uh, versus we keep coming across random strangers that get disrupted from their lives and we have to catch them up on what's going on. So that is, that is one difference I would say in long form versus short form adventures. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, now, now there is uh, magic and there are spells in call of Cthulhu too, although it's less common for players to have access to that sort of thing. Um, I haven't really used spells or magic much at all in any of my uh, in any of my games. But how does how does spells and magic work in in Call of Cthulhu? Uh, well, spells and magic are it, it follows more of the kind of classic sword and sorcery system of the hero doesn't use the hero is not the one with the magic. The bad guys have the magic. So um, kind of like Conan, the, the the bad guys were the wizards. Conan was the mm. The, the rough and tumble soldier uh, call of Cthulhu kind of has the same philosophy. The cultists and the monsters have the magic. If people, if characters cast magic, it will cost them sanity to do because they're having to use powers that are beyond our understanding of the world to, to do. And that chips away at their sanity and their kind of grip on reality because they're slowly realizing that their reality is nothing mm. and there is a lot of risk so every time a character casts a spell there is a cost and certain spells that cost is a lot more than others so well yes there is spells that characters can learn and they can be very powerful and very handy they probably want to use all their options of what to do other than cast the spell yeah before they say Okay, I'm going to cast a spell to get us out of the situation because the spell will cost them um, in a big way. So it it it's available, but it's not like it's not like a wizard that can just throw a spell every time. Every time there's a problem, 
Yeah. And something that I, I quite like um, when it comes to the bad guys, uh, talking about the human bad guys, not the, the old ones, they, they often don't fully comprehend what they're doing because, yeah, as you were saying, the magic is so otherworldly and so unusual that they, they, they perhaps, you know, they understand that they've come across this power, but they don't fully comprehend its origins or the consequences of uh, using it. And and a lot of the bad guys, the, the cultists are already at the point of insanity. So it doesn't hurt them anymore um, because they they've already cracked mentally. They they're uh, so they can they can use, they can cast the spells against you because they've already essentially lost their humanity um, in order to become the spellcaster. And by the time you meet them, it's probably too late to even uh, save them. But the, uh, the then they might be blinded by you know the the ultimate power or whatever their goal was that caused them to do this, and uh, they're they're kind of skewed perception of reality now. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's um, I don't know. I think that there are a few games that I've come across that managed to pull off that that moment, as you were saying, where the the player is is in this situation where they're sort of almost cursing themselves for having to to use magic, you know, knowing that, that it's going to end badly, but you know, what option do they have anyway? Because they're, they're dealing with the mythos. Yeah. And so it, 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 it's a good, you know, it's an option. They've got it, but it's, it's very rarely going to be the first option they take. Um, and it, it kind of has that, that weight to the decision of I'm going to cast a spell. And everyone's like, Oh, <laughs> Because it will cost you sanity whether it's successful or not. Because some of them still require um, a pow check or, or some other type of uh, role to determine if it's successful. Except for the sanity will always always be part of it. You'll always lose that. So it shouldn't be thrown around lightly. No. So that I think that's pretty much the the system in a nutshell. I don't think there's anything we missed there, right? No. Um, yeah. Really, if I was to, the, the only big thing I would really add is the this is what I love about Call of Cthulhu isn't the horror uh, because I've always had horror in every game I've played, whether it be science fiction or D and D. It is that it's also very engineered to promote investigation type plays, mystery solving. Uh, Agatha Christie, I think, is as much of a literary influence on uh, Call of Cthulhu as H.P. Lovecraft, uh, because it is very much about investigation. And that's that's really the big draw that, that keeps me at the game, is you know, I love the system, but I also love investigative adventures. Yeah, definitely. That was the big draw for me as well. I've always been a huge fan of of noir and uh, Agatha Christie, the mysteries. So it definitely scratches that itch while giving you, you know, a, a nice uh, flavor of horror. Oh, because I'll often say like a great Call of Cthulhu movie to watch is the Maltese Falcon. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing supernatural about it. Uh, but other than that, it is a perfect Call of Cthulhu adventure. The characters are all kind of over the top. They're going after some sort of, you know, fabled item and it is, there's all those aspects of a Call of Cthulhu adventure except for there's no monster other than the people yeah exactly the people were the real monsters all along yeah um and I think the one goal the golden rule of noir and I think this works for any system which is the golden rule of noir if the players are stuck always have a bunch of enemies burst through the door and start messing things up oh yeah the uh, uh the chandler's law uh, raymond chandler yeah <laughs> his writing advice so, you know if, if you get stuck have a bad guy come through with you know, the door with a gun and uh that's perfect so um what do you need to play call of cthulhu you need a set of dice Right, and I th it's just the the two main books, right? There's the Investigator's Handbook and the Keeper's Guide. Really, the Keeper's Guide is the only one that you need. Uh, the Investigator's Handbook is is great. It has a lot of valuable information in it, but most of that and all of the essential stuff to play is only in the is already in the Keeper's Guide. Yeah, uh, the Investigator's Handbook will give us a couple more options, uh, 
but it's it's not like uh, D&D or other games. There's like a player's guide that's got half the information you need and then a game master's guide that's got the other half. It's really just the keeper's guide is the only actual book you need and some dice. And and after that, you're set. And some friends. But if you're going to buy another book, highly recommend the investigator's guide. It's It's wonderful. Yeah. And would you say um, beyond that, there's a lot of content and a lot of resources out there for anyone who wants to pick up Call of Cthulhu? Oh, there's there's tons. One of the things that I absolutely adore about the, uh, the, the current, the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu is it is fully backwards compatible, which is almost unheard of because the game is 40 years old. Uh, so for stuff like adventures, I've picked up adventures from you know, 1984 and run them and I can do all the conversions in my head. It's that simple. Uh, so there are decades and decades worth of uh, resources or fan forums that, that talk about different things you could do or just it's, it's so much. Mm. And so, but it's not like when a new edition came out, everything that was written before is, you know, obsolete. No, you, you can convert it in your head. Yeah. It is it is so incredibly the, – the amount of changes that they've made over that time have all been very subtle tweaks. And they're so easy to convert that I I don't have to prep the conversion. I can, just, I can look down and do it. Uh, so that is one of the biggest appeals is the entire back catalog is just as valid as it always was. Yeah. And because it's been around for so long, the back catalog is is massive. But also not just from um, the publisher, uh, Chaosium. Um, there's, there's also like a, a huge and great community of writers out there you know, writing all kinds of adventures, which you can find on places like Drive Through RPG and stuff like that. So there's just a, a huge um, oh yeah amount of of content out there. A lot of different licensed ones. Uh, different companies have have published their own stuff for it. So tons and tons of, of, of available content out there that uh, I, I don't think there's that many people that could possibly have even seen all of it. Yeah. So it's just, it's just so much. I, I'm always learning of some like great book that I've never heard of. And I've been doing this for a long time and I've kind of prided myself on how much of all the different books out there I'm aware of. And I still casually have somebody tell me like, oh, yeah, you didn't know about this one? Like, no. And uh, it's just it, it, it's pretty much unlimited as far as how much is out there. In addition to the the stuff that people can publish themselves through the Miskatonic Repository, which is, uh, you know, where creators create their own stuff and they put it on drive through RPG. So. Uh, that's a completely other zone of a ton of resources out there. So uh, I want to get your final thoughts. Um, we've talked a lot about what you like. Is there anything that you don't like about Call of Cthulhu, about the system? Uh, see, um, if if I was going to change anything about Call of Cthulhu, uh, there's, there's two. There's really only two, and they're very minor. Uh, the first is... Their automatic weapons fire rules are kind of goofy, so I would streamline those. Um, but their sanity mechanics, um, I think, could use an update because games that have come out since have incorporated more personal and backstory elements to their, their own sanity mechanics, such as uh, Delta Green, you have your character has relationships with NPCs, like you know my my wife at home or you know my you know my childhood best friend, and with those, as your sanity goes down or to avoid sanity loss, you can actually decrease your relationships to where when you get home after the adventure, you and your wife don't actually connect as well as they used to because of oh. what you had mentally endured. Um, and then uh, Cult Divinity Lost has relationships also built into their, their stability system. So I would like to see that as well as I would like to have sanity uh, kind of changed a bit because there's two types of sanity loss in the game. There's mythos, like a deep one or a ghoul or Shoggoth jumps out at you and you lose sanity because it's some unspeakable horror. But then there's also sanity loss that's almost like jump scare sanity loss or... 
uh, you see a dismembered body, which, yes, should mm. shake you and might cause panic or fright, but shouldn't change you the same way that seeing the Shagath does. So I would kind of like to break it into those two categories of almost like, you know, fright or startlement sanity loss and mythos sanity loss. So I would, I would, I would like to reconfigure how that works. Um, but that's it. Uh, and the system itself, I don't actually have any complaints with, but I have been, I have given a lot of thought to like, if I could change anything, <laughs> what would I make better? And those are the two areas. Yeah, fair enough. No, that does make a lot of sense um, in regards to the sanity. I, I think I, I, I definitely agree. Um, so yeah, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share on uh, Call of Cthulhu and the system? I, Call of Cthulhu is, is was one of those games that for years... I I didn't play it because I, there are a lot of m myths about it. Uh, a lot of it is in one shot play. It is extremely lethal. So a lot of people are introduced to the game at a convention or a game shop. They're doing a one shot, and in those, it's like a horror movie. You you might have a total party kill, uh, or one person might survive. And so I've always been told everyone dies. Everyone always goes insane. Um, or you have to be, have a mastery of Lovecraft uh, in order to play it. None of that is true. Uh, I don't. You don't have to even know any Lovecraft to do it. And we have had characters that have lasted years mm. without permanent insanity or death. So, it, 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 but it's a game. The first time I actually read it and I got past those myths, it, it was kind of a jaw drop of oh my god where has this game been my entire life? Because I had been trying to make that on my own through cobbling together other systems and these tangled, horrific messes of trying to house rule a system to do something it's not supposed to do. And then Call of Cthulhu did it far more elegantly than anything I would have come up with. And it's very role-play heavy and, once again, very investigative. Mm. So I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, I've heard those those stories as well before I played Call of Cthulhu that everyone's going to go insane and the you know the the World War 1 pilot had flashbacks and ended up shooting the rest of the party and all that kind of thing but maybe I'm too soft on my players cuz when I when I jumped in and started running them even my my shorter scenarios I've never really had an uh, had a scenario had a game where where everyone's died the players always make it through to the end and you know solve the mystery it might not be a good ending might not be a happy ending but they always make it through to the end and and uh, get some kind of result i don't think i've ever had a tpk in a one shot that i was running i've played in ones that did uh but you know maybe i am i'm i'm too soft myself but uh, i also have some very seasoned players uh, that have played with me for 20 years. So <laughs> they're, they're also really, really uh, careful. So part, it might be that I'm soft. It might be that I'm playing with some, some players that are also just really, really good. Uh, but yeah, th those myths about it, you know, and we still joke about them. I'll still joke about them, but they're also not true. So I try not to joke about them as much uh, because a lot of people will be turned away from the game because they believe that's yeah. what, what it is. And the truth is, it could be, but that's actually not what it has to be, uh, because it, it, it's it's a lot of things. And for one shots, yes, lots of death. But for campaign play or for regular play, no, not at all. Yeah, and it, it, then it definitely depends on the scenario. Like you said, like for the for the first one that I'm going to run for the for the podcast, I actually did it as a, a one on one to kind of dispel that that myth that it's like it has to be incredibly deadly and. You know, the characters are, are all going to die. And I kind of wanted to lean into the noir trope. So I ran it with just one player uh, who was playing a, a private investigator. Uh, and it was very good and also very scary for, for my player and investigator because I didn't really have anyone else to, to lean on. One-on-one um, -on -one games for Call of Cthulhu, I think, is really where it does excel. And to me, that's actually what is more Lovecraft. You know, most of Lovecraft's stories are one character. Not a group of characters. Mm. Um, you know, you've got you know, Mountains of Madness and a few others that are groups, but for the majority of them, you're following one person through the whole thing, and they're alone, 
and they have that sense of isolation, and and that's what leads to the horror. So I think Call of Cthulhu is perfect for that type of play, of it's just you, and you're discovering this, <laughs> you know, this dark mystery or family secret, and oh, it's wonderful. Exactly, and who do I tell? Uh, you know, who's going to even believe me? Uh, which really adds into the the madness. <laughs> oh yeah, and. And, you know, because a lot of people say, like, well, why don't they go and tell the cops? It's like, one, you, you listen to the story you're going to try to tell the cops. I mean, really? And then, two, yeah, but what if the cops are in on it in this small town You your car has broken in, down in and they're all in this cult? Uh, so uh, I, I love one-on-one -on -one play with it because it's, it's very personal. And that, that sense of aloneness is great. All right, Seth, um, before you go, um, where can people find more of you? Oh, well, you can find me on uh, YouTube at Seth Skorkowski. Good, good luck. Once you can figure out how to spell that, you're pretty well set. Um, <laughs> and of course, uh, once you know that, you can find uh, you know any of my books. I'm on the Modern Mythos podcast uh, with John Hook, who's uh, written several Call of Cthulhu scenarios. And then on Twitter, which is I'm, I'm currently still on that, is uh, S. Skorkowski. And I'm usually rambling about some bad horror movie that I'm watching or some obscure thought that crossed my mind on that. Uh, that's pretty much the big places to find me. All right. Seth Skorkowski. Sko oh, now I'm getting tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's been my whole life. Don't worry. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> well, Seth Skorkowski, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. This is nice. Uh, my name is Chris, and uh, we will be back with more episodes of RPG Quest, where I finally get to run some games as we dive into Call of Cthulhu. I will see you all then. Bye now. <laughs>